Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome to our Signpost series webinar this morning. My name is Andy Boland, and I'm going to be your host for the next hour or so as we talk through and discuss another issue of farming in, and the environment. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined this morning by three colleagues, two from the Agricultural Catchments Programme, Dr. Bridget Lynch and Dr. Augie Zuraravec. And both of them are going to give us an update on the Catchments Programme. <clears throat> but uh, before that, it's been a very busy week. Both of you are joining us from Thunakilty this morning because it's the end of your Agricultural Catchments uh, Open Week. And um, before we begin the presentation, Maybe you might like to uh, give us a, a brief rundown on well, what you're doing yourselves within the, the programme, but also uh, the week and how it went for you. So I'm a research officer. Um, I'm a research agronomist in the Agricultural Catchments Programme and in the wider Environment, Soils and Land Use Department. I'm based in Johnstown Castle. Um, and yeah, we are, this is the last day of our Agricultural Catchments Week. Um, so it started last week with a webinar by my colleagues, Perg Melander and Jason Galloway. Um, and during the week, we've had a number of podcasts, online articles have been published um, on Chagas Daily. Um, and we have our webinar now again here. And then we will finish up with an open day, a farm walk at our Timberley catchment at the Outlet Point. Um, so that starts at 11. So myself and Augie are here in Clonakilty Agricultural College. Um, they're facilitating us here to do the webinar. And it's a lovely sunny day in West Cork. So we couldn't ask for better, I guess, for our open day to finish up the week. OK. Um, we're also joined by Tom O'Dwyer. Tom is the programme manager for the Signpost programme, and Tom is going to keep an eye on the Q&A and help facilitate the questions as we uh, after Augie and Bridges' presentation. Morning, Tom. Thanks for giving us a dig out. That's OK, Andy. You're welcome. I'm interested to um, hear the presentations from our two colleagues, Bridget and Augie. Augie, you might tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, what, what work you do within the ACP. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, my name is uh, Augie Zurovets, and uh, I'm a soil scientist in the catchments program. So, uh, yeah, I, well, it was a busy week. Yeah, I've been in Clonakilty here since uh, Wednesday. I have to do my some of my regular like soil and water sampling, as you will see in my presentation. And yeah, so we're here for the webinar now and we'll be heading off to, to our open day later like as soon as we're finished here. And yeah, we're very lucky with the weather and yeah, looking forward to it. OK, well, thank you both very much for taking the time out of a busy week to, to talk to us. Um, I'd just like to remind people that our series is brought in conjunction uh, with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, Food Drink Ireland, Skillnet and the National Rural Network. And a recording of today's presentation will be made available uh, on our website. And we also do a podcast version wherever you wish to download your podcast. So, Bridget, you might like to begin and get the ball rolling and begin your presentation. Um, so I'm going to give an update on the gaseous emissions um, part of the program um, on behalf of myself and McDar O'Neill, who was the gaseous emissions research officer who worked on the program until recently. So just in case any of the viewers this morning uh, weren't tuned in last week, just a quick rundown on the Agricultural Catchments Programme. It was established in 2008 and has been fully funded by the Department of Agriculture um, since then um, through four year funding cycles and we're in, currently in the fourth phase of the programme. So it's a unique programme in that it combines both research and knowledge transfer and our staff are made up of technicians, technologists, research officers, in addition to advisors and uh, a knowledge transfer specialist. Um, so we have 23 staff across six um, agricultural catchments um, and we engage and have 300 farmers that we deal with in those um, catchments. It collects, I, I guess, both biophysical, so that's the 
soil science and water quality and gaseous emissions data, as well as having a socioeconomic appraisal of the program and um, uh, the, the policy that's that we review. Um, it's a focus point um, for catchment science knowledge transfer and for water quality um, and also gaseous emissions knowledge transfer. Um, and that's evident, I guess, in the, the drive that we have this week with our, with our um, um, agricultural catchments week. Um, so the program was set up to evaluate um, the nitrates action program um, in addition to the nitrates derogation. And I guess it, it has evolved to be a wider um, policy evaluation program. The program, uh, I guess, has evolved over the phases. Um, and I guess in the current phase, we've probably seen the largest kind of expansion of the baseline biophysical data collection in that it expanded the remit of the programme to include um, gaseous emissions, um, so greenhouse gases, ammonia and carbon sequestration, in addition to adding to the soil science remit of the programme um, by looking at soil solution monitoring for nitrate and phosphorus. And Augie is going to collect that uh, or going to focus on that in his presentation. Um, so I guess the reason for the expansion and the inclusion of the gaseous emissions in what is a water quality focus program um, in the first three phases is to see, I guess, um, what regulations may be brought in to improve water quality or gaseous emissions if they work in tandem with each other um, or if they're perhaps antagonistic to each other. So this is, I suppose, the core baseline um, data collection um, that we do in the program. So it works on the basis of um, tracking um, the nutrient transfer continuum. So the source of nutrients, so um, nitrogen and phosphorus, the mobilization of those nutrients, the transfer of them um, through the landscape and the delivery of those um, in the river and the impact of that um, delivery and uh, those nutrients on the freshwater ecology. So where does, I guess, the gaseous emissions side come into or how can it um, complement the current um, measurements um, that we do? So the management data or the um, information that we know with regards to the imports of nutrients and also carbon as well is ongoing through LIPIS data from the Department of Agriculture, but also um, through our data recorders and our, our farm advisors. And that's important, I guess, when we're looking to try and understand imports and exports of um, uh, carbon, but also um, uh, ammonia as well. We do a soil sampling campaign, um, and Augie will expand on this later, every four years. Um, they're agronomic samples, um, but we've been able to go back and analyse them for carbon, nitrogen, total carbon, nitrogen, and also organic carbon. We have a MET station in all of the catchments. Um, um, transfer pathways have been identified throughout the programme. And then with regards to our, our monthly snapshot samples and the um, high resolution monitoring um, at the outlet, um, we have been measuring TOC at the outlet um, for the last four years. So we can potentially, I suppose, in addition to nitrogen and phosphorus and looking at its transfer continuum, we can also look at the carbon transfer continuum and look at carbon losses or hydrological carbon losses. So this um, slide summarises the um, ongoing work on the gaseous emissions side. So there's five educovariance towers that have been deployed um, across a number of the catchments, and that started in late 2020. We have analysed the first soil sampling campaign, um, agronomic soil samples for total carbon, nitrogen and organic carbon. And we have also analysed the most recent um, campaign that was done in phase four, and we're able to look at the change in um, soil organic carbon in the first 10 centimetres as a screening tool. We have begun um, the soil profile pit digs um, to find out what the bulk density and percent organic carbon is, um, where the um, edicovariance towers are situated. And we do that in tandem with other um, similar programs like the signpost to make sure that I suppose all programs are working to the same methodology. 
Um, we're also measuring active ammonia um, in the atmosphere um, in Castle Dockerill, which is hypothesized to be our low ammonia site, the Castle Dockerill crop site, um, and then also Ballycanoe, which is a dairy grazing site, um, which is hypothesized to be a high ammonia site. And then there's other co-located um, equipment. Um, so the ISMON program, which has deployment of the Cosmos in situ soil moisture array um, at various locations across the country. But there's one of those co-located um, with the tower in Ballycanoe and Craig Duff um, through the Terrain AI program, um, there's been extensive drone surveying um, done at the Castle Dockerill grass and crop sites. And in addition, there's soil auto chambers installed at the Castle Dockerill sites that can measure carbon dioxide um, as well um, and to compare that to the flux data that we get. So in my, I suppose in the update today, I'm just going to concentrate on the edicovariance tower work um, and look at some of the outputs from that, some of our initial observations. So the towers were placed um, in five different locations. So Craig Duff um, is our extensive grazing site. So this is where we've grassland that's extensively grazed um, by sheep and beef animals that are co-grazing. Um, Tim League is our intensive dairy grazing slash silage site, um, and that's a freely draining soil type. Um, and the tower is located on the Milken platform on that farm. Castle Dockerill, we have two towers. So we've one in a, in a crop rotation site um, and one in a zero grazing slash silage cutting site, grassland site, um, and that's freely draining. And then in Ballycanoe, we have a, an intensive dairy grazing. It's situated on a paddock on, in the Milken platform, and that's a poorly um, draining um, catchment or, or soil type there. So I'm just going to concentrate on, I suppose, the, the first four there, Craig Duff, Timely, Castle Dockerill, um, crop and zero grazing in, in this presentation. And just to say, I suppose, the site selection for these towers, there's quite a lot of um, work goes into site selection um, as to where they're going to be situated. Not all sites fields or farms are suitable. Um, you need a, a flat terrain. Um, you need to have a southwesterly facing fetch. Um, we need management information to ulti ultimately be able to do a, a carbon balance. Um, and then we also need, I suppose, most importantly, it should be short, top of the list, farmer engagement um, uh, to allow us to deploy these pieces of equipment onto privately owned um, farms. So these five towers, uh, and people may be familiar with the National Agricultural Soil Carbon Observatory or NASCO. So these five towers um, are part of that. Um, so there's 30 flux towers um, being deployed as part of NASCO and our five towers will feed into that network and into that data as well. So similar objectives, I guess, um, across both programs, you know, to investigate agricultural land use and the management inputs um, and I suppose what impact that has on annual estimates um, and what are the drivers of carbon gain and loss. So there are, I think, five more of the 30 in total um, to be deployed um, and the target it is, is to have that done by the end of this month. So this is the um, equipment um, that you would see or maybe have seen maybe on some of the research farms or out on some of the commercial farms. Um, so the edicovariance tower method of measuring carbon dioxide is a, a, what we call a micrometeorological method. So in addition to having a carbon and a water vapor, vapor analyzer, which is the case um, in the towers that we have, you also have um, a number of, um, I suppose, uh, equipment that measures the immediate um, uh, climatic conditions um, because they are very important, I guess, uh, explainers of the um, uh, carbon dioxide fluxes that we observed. Um, so there are a number of other analyzers that you can get and attach to the towers as well. So you can get a methane analyzer and a nitrous oxide analyzer. Um, we just have the carbon dioxide analyzer um, on our towers. 
So they operate by um, measuring the fluxes of carbon dioxide. Um, so what is photosynthesized from the atmosphere um, by the plants. Um, in, in this case, it's grassland or, or crop production. Um, and then what is respired by that agricultural ecosystem. Um, and the difference between what is photosynthesized and what is respired is what we call net ecosystem carbon dioxide exchange or NEE is what I'll refer to it throughout. Um, so the towers or the analyzers, they take 10 measurements per second, 365 days a year. So highly, highly automated. And as I said already, the biomet sensors, um, they, I suppose, help us identify the drivers of um, net ecosystem exchange. So I'm just going to explain maybe some of the terminology that you're going to see in the graphs in the next couple of slides. So the um, unit of measure in the y-axis is fluxes of carbon in, in micromoles of carbon dioxide per meter squared per second. And we have days of the year on the y-axis. Um, this black line, horizontal line here, just indicates where zero is sitting. Um, and the blue line that you'll see in all the graphs is um, RE, or it's ecosystem respiration or respiration. The red line is what's called gross primary productivity or photosynthesis, um, and that's the red line. And then the difference between these two is our net ecosystem exchange, and that will be represented by a green line in all the graphs. Um, so if the green line or net ecosystem exchange is below zero and it's a negative value, that means it's a sink of carbon dioxide. If it's above the line, that means it's a source of carbon dioxide. So first, I'm going to show you our arable site. Um, so this uh, data is from the 20th of January through to the 1st of November 2022. And it's a winter wheat crop um, that was um, grown that year, or last year. Um, and we have N1 represents the first application of nitrogen. N2 is the second application of nitrogen. Um, and then we have the harvest as well that occurred um, uh, later in the year. Underneath then we have biomass um, and uh, we have the flower is represented by the red line. The green serrated line is the leaf. Um, the root is the blue line and then the purple is the stem of the crop. So it, it's important that we take biomass samples throughout the year to understand what the, the carbon um, uptake is in, in the biomass samples. So um, what do we observe? So we observe greater net ecosystem um, exchange corresponding with increases in leaf area index. So we saw um, uptake um, throughout the year, which peaked um, uh, corresponding with the peak in leaf area index, which corresponds to about day 140 down here. Um, we had sustained carbon uptake during grain filling. Um, however, ecosystem respiration exceeded net photosynthesis about three weeks out from harvest. Um, um, and obviously, as the, the crop starts to mature and become close to harvest, you've less green leaf material or green material um, and um, there's less um, photosynthesis. Um, and then after harvest, we can see that there was a small carbon uptake recorded um, with the volunteer growth that came there afterwards. Um, this is our intensive, sorry, um, our dairy grazing um, site. Um, so what we've got up here is the flux footprint or the contour map showing the flux footprint. So the tower is situated here. Um, you can see the contour lines have numbers on them. So you can see this one says 80%. That means that 80% of the um, flux data that we're recording is explained by the activity of that area. Um, and we also have the windrows um, map here as well, just for your information. So in this map, we've got a number of harvests, obviously, because it's a grazing and a silage cutting site. So we have the harvest throughout here. You can see that uh, the... Well, first of all, the fluxes that we observed, the variation and the magnitude are what we would expect in a, a deer, in a grazing situation, rotational grazing situation. 
Um, so carbon uptake uh, progressively increased to a maximum series of cuts. So you can see that we'd uptake, I guess, right throughout the grazing season. Um, and then that started to decrease and become a, a net source um, as we moved um, towards the latter end of the grazing season. Um, here, this, this um, where we can see the net ecosystem exchange um, above zero. Um, so this also coincides about July, August period. Um, and we might remember last year we had a drought period around then that stretched into September, um, also having an impact. This is our zero grazing site, zero grazing or silage cutting site. Um, so again, the, the contour map showing the flux footprint um, and our wind roses. Um, and here again, we have the various harvests or defoliations or grazings or silages represented by um, the black lines uh, indicated there. So the flux magnitude coincides with um, the cutting period and the rate of carbon uptake was lower after defoliation. So um, I guess after an offtake um, and typically as was farmers zero graze at higher covers um, than they would graze at. And obviously after silage cuts, um, there's not a lot of green leaf material there to photosynthesize and the rate of carbon uptake is lower after the defoliation. We also saw an impact, I suppose, of time of year um, and also um, probably the drought as well um, between harvest four and five here, um, where you can see that the net ecosystem exchange um, green line is above zero um, and, and becoming a, a source there. This is our extensive grazing site. Um, so Again, black line representing zero. This site is continuously grazed um, by cattle and sheep co-grazing together. So we don't necessarily have um, harvest lines in this as it's been continuous. It's in a continuous stocking system. Um, the max daily um, photosynthesis is generally higher compared to the arable or the dairy grazing sites. We see that the trends of net ecosystem exchange, you can see that it's a much more jagged line, if you like. Um, so it fluctuates widely. Um, um, and I suppose the drivers of that um, could be weather or management. And similar, I suppose, to the arable and the zero grazing sites, the net carbon uptake slows down at about a day 300. Um, so you can see that uh, net ecosystems exchange is, is um, running along there um, underneath the, the line. Um, and then as we reach towards the end of the year, it starts to become a, a source or it starts to slow down. The respiration rate um, was higher compared to the other sites. Um, so there is perhaps a carbon dioxide flux source below ground. Um, so it could be you know, this is a permanent pasture. It's a lot more diverse compared to, I suppose, the newer pastures that you would typically have on a dairy grazing or around the zero grazing site. Um, so perhaps there is more respiration coming from the root network or the microbial um, population in that site. So it's quite interesting when you compare it to the other um, intense um, grazing grassland sites. So to summarise, um, net ecosystem exchange at the arable site is regulated by crop development, and that would tie in with other observations from work to date. Um, cutting and grazing frequency observed to influence net ecosystem exchange at the grassland sites, and the rate of carbon uptake was lower after defoliation. Um, the recovery period uh, seems to take longer as the season progresses and um, can be limited um, by the weather conditions or the drought conditions that we saw um, last year. The extensive grazing site and the trends of net ecosystem exchange, they fluctuate widely um, and the, the drivers of that, I suppose, need to be examined. So whether it's weather management, the underlying soil processes and respiration, I, I suppose that that work continues. 
And look, these are initial observations. Um, we need um, more years of data. Um, these towers are, are being deployed for the long term. So we need longer data sets and greater continuity of the data before we can definitely, um, you know, um, identify um, management and weather effects or drivers of what we're seeing. And look, the work continues. So what I show today is output from just the, the flux towers. We need to couple that with management data in order to do a full import and export of um, carbon to the system and to come up with a, a carbon balance of um, tons of carbon per hectare per year. The baseline soil organic carbon um, profile pits are continuing um, uh, this year. Um, and I suppose this ties into the new Chagas Climate Centre roadmap, um, whereby Q1 of 2027, um, the target is to have Irish specific soil carbon sequestration emission factors determined by then. Um, so that's it from me. Um, and I can stop sharing and hand over to Augie. Thanks very much, Bridget. And I just before Augie starts or gets going, could I remind people again to send in the questions? There's loads of questions coming in. Once again, hello, everybody. And uh, I'm going to give you an update on the latest uh, research, soil, soil research in the agriculture catchments program. So Bridget gave a good overview of all our activities, like from, from all sides of the catchments program. And she also mentioned that uh, we expanded our activities to first the greenhouse gas emission side, which she explained in detail. And uh, in terms of soils and soil research, uh, the significant uh, expansion came in, in the context of so-called soil solution monitoring. So just before I move on to the main activities in relation to our soil, soil solution monitoring, just to say a few brief words about, I'm sure most of you are aware about the nitrogen use efficiency on the farms and that's that NUE or nitrogen use efficiency sits around 25 percent like on a typical grassland dairy farm in Ireland which means that up to three-thirds or 75 percent of nitrogen uh, is either fixed in soil or lost somewhere in the environment uh, usually as gaseous emissions like ammonia and nitrous oxide and uh, what we're going to focus on and what will be kind of the main point of, of our of this presentation will be will be focused on nitrate leaching. So uh, all the nitrogen which leaves the root zone uh, is well as long well since it would be out of the reach of the root zone and will never be taken up by plants again. So that nitrate uh, will is very mobile and will move with the groundwater with with the soil water eventually to reach the groundwater and from there it could have an impact on our water bodies. So we already have, uh, in most of the catchments, we have a, a groundwater monitoring network. And uh, with the soil solution monitoring, we are kind of adding one piece to the puzzle there to estimate or to, to, to measure how much uh, nitrate uh, will leave the root zone or is, is leaving the root zone and uh, then combine it with our groundwater and, and high resolution water monitoring to kind of get the better picture and knowledge of the nutrient cycling and the processes happening since after the nitrate leaves the root zone on its way to groundwater and, and our surface water. Uh, for the soil solution monitoring, we picked the uh, Timoli catchments as a case study. And the reason why uh, Timoli catchment is located in West Cork uh, near Clonakilty. And the reason why we picked Clonakilty uh, Timoli catchment is that it represents one of the most intensively farmed regions in Ireland. And another thing is because uh, as you can see on the soil map here, uh, let's see that the catchment is dominated by so-called cambisols, you'd know them better as, as brown earths, which are well-drained. So there is a risk there because, uh, for, of this, because the soils are freely drained, there is a risk of, of uh, nitrate leaching uh, in, on these soils and in this area, which could have an impact on, on water quality in the region. Uh, another uh, fact about uh, Timalig is that I already mentioned it's one of the most intensively areas in Ireland. As you can see here, the, the 
dominating uh, land use in the catchments is it's, it's mostly or almost completely under grasslands. And as you can see on the right figure here that uh, it's, it's also highly stocked and uh, most of the farms or, or, or the areas here are under derogation. Uh, so what was the selection process uh, for the sites we've chosen to, to uh, install our equipment and, and measure uh, soil drainage? Uh, one of the main, uh, main, re when main points we want to see is the difference between uh, potential for, for nitrate leaching between a derogation and non-derogation farm. And uh, we started, as you will see later in the presentation, we started with two sites, one in derogation and one in non-derogation, but then we decided to, to expand further. Uh, we wanted all the sites to be on the same soil type so they, they can be comparable. So we picked the soil type you've seen in the previous uh, uh, slide, which was the brown earths which are dominant in the catchment. And yeah, we also, in order to, for the sites to be comparable and be in the similar conditions. So we picked the sites which were similar in kind of physical setting, which be topography, altitude and slope. Uh, so you see the selection process there. And then at the end, you see the area which we had at our disposal, which met all those three requirements. And then within uh, this area, we had to, uh, choose the suit, choose the suitable sites for for what we wanted to accomplish. So that brings the other two uh, parts, other two points for for the selection process. We wanted the uh, wanted variability in from in farms in terms of the organic and loading. So we'll have different farms as you will see in the next slide, and we also want them to differ in grassland management. So some of the sites would be like in part of the milking platform. Uh, some of them would be combined kind of silage and grazing. And we also have one site which is uh, zero grazing. Uh, so here you can see the overview of the, of the sites. And you see that uh, we have four sites in total and that they differ in terms of their management. So for the the uh, non-derogation uh, site, we picked the low input pasture, which is on, on the mixed farm. Uh, and then other three sites uh, are in derogation, but uh, they differ in their management. So one of them is intensively managed grazing paddock, which is a part of, of the milking platform. And uh, the other site is, is uh, used for, for silage, uh, first cut silage in, in the spring, and then it's in the grazing rotation for, for the rest of the year. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have a site which is uh, used in, in zero grazing system and for silage. So, and you, you can see in the table below their uh, organic and inorganic uh, and inputs. This is typical throughout the year. Uh, we record all these information that we keep the, the record of, of everything which is applied, all the organic and inorganic fertilizers uh, applied in the field. And we also estimate the organic and input based uh, on the, the herd size and the, the amount of time the, the animals uh, spend uh, grazing in the field, like per, per grazing period and then total throughout the year. So what you see here, the total and inputs, they're not, uh, you'd usually see them represented per, per farm. Uh, this is estimate, these are the estimations only for that specific field we are talking about where the lysimeter site, where the soil solution monitoring site is. With the exception of number four here, you see it uh, marked, uh, we still have incomplete data for, for that site. I think this is up to August or, or something like that in, in last year. So I mentioned already, we started with uh, initially with two sites uh, and they were established in autumn 2021. And uh, we've been trialing two different uh, sampling methods, which you will see in the, on the next slide. And uh, once we accomplished uh, our main objective, which was to uh, monitor a soil solution on derogation and non-derogation farms, which was also the requirement of the, and something which the European Commission uh, asked and required in terms of, of nitrate derogation. So once we fulfilled that objective, we, so we decided that, yeah, we want more and we want to move one step further and add more sites, which, which differ in management. So we added two new sites in, in September last year. 
And uh, as you can see on the pictures here, like it's it's a very like these the, the lysimeters and we use and they're they're put underground and it's a fairly well, aggressive and destructive process, and uh, therefore like it takes time for the soil structure and the root zone above the lysimeter to kind of uh, recover and and uh, is back into the natural conditions so that's that's something you you cannot rush and uh, that's why uh, we expect although we we started two years ago we expect our first kind of full scientifically sound and then comprehensive results at least from the two two sites in which were established in 2021 we'll have the full comprehensive results uh, in summer 2023 uh, the drainage season, it has been a fairly wet year and the actually drainage season is still ongoing. I was on the sites last two days and I was still taking samples and there is still a drainage collected in the lysimeters. But yeah, it's expected that the drainage season will be over probably in the in the next week or two. So and that will give us the time to, to sit down and uh, analyze the results and, and have something to, to report. Uh, later in this year. Uh, so how do I, uh, I keep talking about the sites and, uh, and the lysimeters. So, so what, how does the, uh, our, one of our, well, this, what you see on the right is the kind of typical layout of, of one of our soil solution monitoring sites. Uh, so you see that each site consists of six so-called uh, wick lysimeters. These are those big uh, steel rings you've seen on, on the picture, on, on the slide before and on the, on the picture on the left. And uh, then we also have three clusters of four ceramic cup samplers per site, which brings up to 12 samplers in total. So we have 18 samples from coming from, from each field every time when we take the sample. And uh, we've chosen two different ways to, to uh, take samples and to monitor soil solution and we're still in the pro in, in in the process of uh, figuring out which uh, method works uh, best in 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 the conditions we have and it's also important to mention and which is unique uh, for 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 this type of research is that uh, all sites are are actually located on, on the actual farms and uh, they are under realistic farming conditions and uh, you, and it was a big challenge to actually have the the whole setup uh, underground, so it doesn't interfere with the, with the farming operations, like the passing of the tractors, like cutting the grass and and grazing and and so on. So you will see that uh, we developed uh, kind of the, our approach was to keep everything underground, and you see that the, the only thing kind of sticking out from 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 the surface are those access caps uh, in the in the top uh, right corner, you can see them. And so, yeah, the whole setup is, is underground. And we are also, yeah, very lucky that uh, we have the support of the farmers in the region and uh, that they allow us access to the land and they, they tolerate our presence every week or fortnight during winter when we come to, to sample water from the lysimeter. So, yeah, we are very grateful for that. Uh, so what is done with the with the samples and uh, how often do we sample? So uh, usually, yeah, it's the drainage season in, in, in Ireland usually starts uh, in early October and lasts until May. So that's when the rainfall is is higher than the, the evapotranspiration. So, so the excess water has been drained below the root zone and uh, our lysimeters are below, located just right below the root zone and 30, 40 centimeters below the root zone. And uh, yeah, they, they go up to, to one meter. So we collect all the drainage up to one meter depth. And uh, so when we are on site every week or fortnight, we take the water sample, we, we pump out the sample with the vacuum pump, we measure the volumes and uh, using those volumes, uh, we can uh, record the, the amount of drainage. And then we take subsample from, from that sample and bring it to our lab, water lab in Johnstown Castle to be analyzed for, for nitrogen and, and, and phosphorus. And uh, what is also important in, in, in this monitoring is to have the constant data recording and to be in constant contact with the farmers and make sure that we record 
all the major uh, farming uh, or events like mainly like fertilization either organic or or, or mineral fertilizer and to record all the grazing events on the site with sites which 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 are grazed so yeah that would be all in terms of uh, lysimeter or soil solution monitoring and then the second thing i would like to talk about as a part of this presentation which i hope many of you will find interesting is the soil fertility trends in some of our catchments so in this case it's before catchments where we have the data for 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 four years and with where everything is is analyzed and and, and prepared uh, as you heard uh, from Bridget, ACP has been running since uh, 2008. And I think the first soil sampling started already in 2009. So we have roughly 20, 12 to, to 13, 14 years of, of, of sampling by now. And although it's, it's, it's a relatively short period, a lot has changed in the Irish farming sector since uh, the ACP has been established. Uh, the most important thing, of course, would be the abolition of milking quotas and uh, also many new policies and regulations uh, aimed at promoting sustainable practices have been introduced since. So we were interested since we have uh, a large uh, data set of soil samples and we were interested to see uh, what was the change in soil fertility during this period. And we selected these four catchments. So two of them are in Wexford, uh, our uh, Dunlear catchment is, count is in County Louth, and then yeah, already mentioned Timalee catchment in, in Cork. Uh, how how does our soil sampling uh, uh, or so, soil sampling survey or 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 what it looks like? So the agricultural area of each catchment is in divided is divided into defined the uh, sampling units, which are roughly around two hectares. So if there is a field a bigger than than two hectares, then we we separate or split it in into the subunits and sub subfields, and then. Uh, you see how the sampling units look like on on the figure on the on the right hand side, and then that brings up to five, five or, or about six hundred samples on average per, per catchment, uh, repeatedly taken from each sampling unit uh, every four years, and that makes it unique uh, in a sense that yeah we're able to track the changes in in soil fertility from almost every field in the catchments, and. Uh, that's that's unique and that's why that's uh, why this uh, data set is is very valuable and it's it's unique not just uh, for 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 the catchments program but like uh, nationwide you 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 i don't think there are there although the areas that are covered by catchments about are, are about 10 uh, square kilometers like they're relatively small in size but the detail we have is 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 very is very good and uh, very interesting so and uh, all these samples are so what what we are analyzing the samples for are uh, our main soil fertility indicators which would be ph uh, pk and lime requirement we do sample we sometimes we uh, uh, sample them for micronutrients or as bridget mentioned all the sam samples because we archive them so all of them have been reanalyzed for for carbon content as well uh, now, I could overwhelm you with lots of figures and graphs showing the changes in soil fertility in each catchment and for, for each uh, nutrient. But uh, yeah, instead, I prepared this uh, simple figure and I would just point out the most important points and the most important things when, when it comes to, to changes in soil fertility trends over the last 12 years or so in the catchments. So in general, we see a small increase in soils with, with good overall, overall fertility, which is, which is now of course a positive thing. And, uh, and, and uh, it shows that we are slowly but steady going into the right direction. And uh, probably one of the most positive things is uh, a very positive trend in terms of soil pH. So there has been a 20% increase in soils above pH of, of 6.2 uh, over since since the since the first time the soils were, were taken soil samples were taken from 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 the catchments uh, in terms of K uh, usually yeah two-thirds of the soils uh, are well supplied with with potassium which which yeah, is also a positive thing and then when we're talking about phosphorus we have uh, well 
there are good well there are some positives and some yeah not such good so so good things like in in terms of phosphorus so what we can point out here are kind of two main concerns in relation to to soil test B content <laughs> and the first one would be environmental where uh, nearly 20 percent of, of our soils are, are p index four uh, which means the excessive soil p content and uh, yeah that presents uh, yeah, that's that's not really positive in terms of when we're talking about the environment, but we also have an opposite trend that there has been an increasing, uh, 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 there are increasing areas and there's like the P contents actually decreasing in, in some of the catchments and uh, more than 60% soils are also with the uh, but they are below the, the agronomic optimum. So we have two different sides of the story here. We have the fields which are with excessively with, with excessive peak content. And then uh, we have uh, areas, substantial areas which are deficient in phosphorus. Uh, and then, yeah, I will just conclude with saying that, yeah, in terms of phosphorus, uh, yeah, there's lots of, there's significant scope for, to, to correct the P balances on farms with the better nutrient management. You see the, the typical uh, dairy farm on, on this figure and uh, you see that most of the phosphorus is located within the, the milking platform. And uh, so there is scope of improvement to, you know, especially when we're talking about organic manures to kind of uh, <laughs> bring the balance to, to, the, uh, to the areas away from the milking platform. And uh, yeah, in, in terms of productivity and in, term, and in terms of environment. So yeah, I will stop here. And yeah, thank you very much for, for, for tuning in. Thanks very much, Augie. Um... So Bridget, yeah, thank you. If you might like to bring back on your camera and Augie, yeah, thanks for stopping to share. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, look, we've, we've a good few questions coming in, so and we haven't got that, a whole lot of time left, so we'll try and get through as many of them uh, as quickly as we can. It just the first thing that, that, that struck me really, uh, Bridget, when, when you look at both your presentations, um, there's a lot of new kit, extra kit, invasive kit <laughs> gone onto farmers' land. I mean. Uh, have you had, I mean, uh, <clears throat> has there been issues with that or, you know, has everybody welcomed you with open arms or, uh, you know, what's been the reaction when you say, when you turn up at all this stuff to, to land on a farm? Yeah, well, I suppose there's a good bit of um, work goes in before we land down with all the gear, Andy. Um, so when um, McDara and Zaid were the research officer and technologist that started the deployment of the towers and the catchments, they would have looked at sites that were suitable. Um, so not everywhere is suitable. So they did a good bit of a sort of decision support tree, if you like, um, or analysis on, on site selection. But then they would have sent out uh, uh, an email via the advisor, the catchment advisor, to see who was interested firstly, before knocking on doors. Um, so the farmers would have been asked who would, be, who would have been interested to, to speak uh, to the researchers um, and see who might be interested in hosting. Um, and yeah, uh, and so it was voluntary in a way um, from, I suppose, those sites that were suitable. Yeah, but it, it's still uh, it's a lot of stuff on your farm, you know. And it's, yeah, it's a big it's, ask to be fair, and they need the power source, so you need a uh, connection uh, to electricity, um, and you need to fence off a bit of your milk platform, and that's yeah, precious. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're we're very appreciative. Always great, grateful to people who you know who do this for us, really. Um, just to pull a couple of questions together, um, Bridget, mainly for yourself. Now, is it what you know? What can farmers do to improve? carbon sequestration and and those figures that you showed us is there any rate per acre that you could give a guy as a or per hectare as a as a guide or um you know but you know what could what could farmers do you know to improve rates of carbon sequestration yeah so it we see both across the grassland and the crop sites from those observations is that leaf area um, and leaf area index is going to promote photosynthesis and carbon dioxide capture. Um, uh, so if you think about, you know, I suppose avoiding ploughing if you can, um, both by machinery and by animals. Um, so try and avoid damage to the soil surface, you know, during difficult grazing times of the year. Um, look at 
minimal cultivation techniques for establishing grassland and for cropland, um, avoiding fallow periods. So trying to enable the establishment um, of uh, volunteers after harvest or for cover crops, look at cover crops. Um, uh, and then, you know, look at mixed species beyond then the, the fields themselves then is to enhance hedgerows, quality, quantity um, and so on. So look, the mineral soils, I suppose they have the potential to sequester 1.5 to 4 tonnes um, of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. Um, so there is the potential yeah. there. Yeah. And just finally, before I go to Tom, um, I mean, most of your, your flux towers are obviously measuring above the ground. Is there any relationship between carbon in the soil or did you look at carbon in the soil below the ground, we say from a tillage to a grassland, intensive grassland to an extensive grassland? Is there soil organic carbon or is there any? Yeah, so we... that came in as well. Yeah, so one of the initial things that the team did was to look at the soil organic carbon in the archive sample. So it's just in the first 10 centimetres, but they were able to look at grassland, uh, permanent grassland, grassland that was converted to tillage and then tillage converted to grassland or to look at the land use of that going from phase one <clears throat> to phase four. Um, and they definitely would have seen that there was a positive change in soil organic carbon. It's only the first 10 centimetres okay. um, when it stayed in grassland and where we saw more organic manures being applied in the catchments as well. Um, and they would have found that if there was grassland, uh, grassland lay as part of tillage rotation, that that would have decreased a uh, decline in soil organic carbon in the, in the arable sites. OK, Tom, over to okay, you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, a couple of questions in for um, yourself, Bridget, and, and then Augie. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you, Bridget. So so the first one um, is um, whether your results um, provide any indication as to whether intensive or extensive grazing systems um, sequester more carbon? Yeah, so I suppose intensive grazing systems, you have more return of, uh, an even return of um, animal excretion to the soils. So there are some positives around that. Um, extensive grazing, obviously you have less chance of um, poaching taking place or there's less receding as well probably that's going to allow ploughing to take place so look I think there's pros and cons of both um, we obviously we have the intensive grazing sites and we have the extensive grazing site in Craig Duff um, so when we pull together the, the imports and the exports um, of carbon overall and do the carbon balance we'll be able to answer that better. All right. And a second question then from already, um, how, how can we compare two systems with or without grazing animals around the towers? And I, I think you have that. I, I think, you know, you had a silage zero grazing system and you had a the, 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 the tower with intensive grazing and extensive grazing. So can, can you make that comparison, Bridget? Is that fair? Yeah, like I suppose they're not completely directly located at the very same site. Um, but yeah, look, that, that's been captured um, across the 30 network, like some will be um, grazing, some will be cutting sites. Um, and it the towers can pick up on the animals when they're there um, around the sites as well. So it'll pick up um, them and also the machinery as well when they're harvested. So it, we have the ability to do that from what's set up. Okay. Um, there's a question from Ru a, a kind of a comment from Ruri and then a question um, that uh, he's been following the ACP for 10 years or more, have seen lots of technical presentations and research papers, PhD presentations, etc. Can I ask then, this is the question, has the ACP produced any accessible guidance documents, best practice guides, list of mitigation measures for farmers and landowners, and if so, where are these best practice guides available? Yeah, so we have a dedicated website um, on the Chagas website. Um, so there's a, a page dedicated for, to publications and they're there. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, like we have a, a KT specialist now. So Eddie Burgess does a lot of outreach work with mm -hmm. groups. Um, so I'm sure he could be contacted as well. OK. For a follow up. OK. All right, uh, for Augie then uh, from Coleman, uh, were there any background nutrient tests done, uh, for example, of non-water soluble locked up P levels? Sorry, can you repeat again? 
Were there any background tests done uh, for uh, non non soluble uh, p levels locked up? I think. Uh, well, when we are talking about the p fractions in soil, and I'm just talking about soil because yeah, I'm a soil scientist, and then yeah, my colleagues would be more yeah from the hydrology side, and and would be into in the water quality. So. Uh, not sure what is meant by non-soluble forms, because when we are talking about the forms directly available to plants, which would be the bioavailable phosphorus, that, that's only like less than 1% fraction of the total phosphorus, and uh, the remaining phosphorus, more than 99%, is, is locked up in soil. Okay. Okay, and another question then from Brendan. Um... So he's just picking up on the fact that 20% of the soils have a um, index 4 P level, uh, and that's above optimum, I, I guess, for agricultural growth. Um, how, how, can we, how can we address this? Or maybe what, what steps are being taken through the Agricultural Catchments Program to address this, to, I suppose, to, to reduce the level of, of soils at index 4 P? Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what, what we're focused on, and it has been like that since the first results came in in the catchments program in relation to phosphorus. And uh, yeah, it has been mentioned already that we have an advisor uh, working with uh, all the farmers within the catchments areas. And uh, yeah, the, what we could do and what would probably be the best thing to do in terms to, to mitigate the phosphorus losses to water is uh, first to when we're talking about the p-index system and so to avoid uh, any source of, of p as a fertilizer on the areas which are p-index four and if within our farm we have areas as i shown it in the last slide i had there so there would be like either areas used for silage or some areas like part of the milking platform with the lower p content and especially when we're talking about organic manures, like there's a significant potential in organic manures. And we tend to forget that or ma organic manures, whether that be slurry or, 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 or some other organic fertilizer, like, uh, you know, poultry manure or pig slurry or anaerobic digesti, they contain a significant amount of phosphorus. And uh, if we redirect that uh, organic manure to the, for, to the fields with the lower p index and avoid p application uh, in the fields with the p index four that would be and as be so yeah that's in the context of our nutrient management plans that would be something to mitigate p emissions and then the other thing we could do is uh, it's important to know well uh, the most kind of risk in terms of phosphorus pollution comes with the so-called critical source area so if our fields with excessive p content are hydrologically connected to the nearby water bodies. That's the, these are the areas which present the biggest risk. And if we try to break the pathway of that water, like coming into the stream by implementing uh, either, I don't know, some sort of buffer strips <laughs> or riparian buffers or anything, or just to keep the soil under the permanent soil cover, like to have it under permanent grasslands or to use uh, catch crops in terms of tillage crops, that would like every blade of grass actually slows down the movement of water and yeah, and helps in a way to, to reduce, to mitigate the pea pollution. Augie and Bridget, sorry, Tom, were you going to come again? Or... Uh, no, I was just going to mention one comment in the, in the questions just from Kieran, uh, our, I, I think he's our colleague in Chagas and yeah. he just says that, um, index four soils, it's going to be very difficult um, mm. to, to reduce the percentage of index four soils uh, where, where the slurry is being put out on the milking platform. Um, so I was going to finish by saying that to, to deliver on what Augie has outlined as a, as a, a practice to, to bring about change, the farmer has to take make decisions, different decisions to the decisions that are currently being made, and that requires a change of practice. So that's yeah. that's it. We I, yeah. Tom, thank you very much for giving us a dig out of the questions. Um, Bridget and Augie, thank you for taking the time out of a very busy week and the best of luck with your open day today. Um, I'd just like to conclude by reminding people, uh, next week we have um, Dr. Sarah LeCavana and she's a project manager on an EIP project that's specifically looking at um, protecting farmland pollinators. Um, I'd also like to thank our colleague uh, Yvonne behind the scenes who did all the, does all the technical work for us every Friday morning. And thank you all 
once again for joining us and hope you can join us uh, next week. So until next week, so You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.